Morning, everyone. And welcome to our worship this Sunday morning. You're very welcome as we gather to praise the Lord together. As we begin, I want to read these words from Psalm 34, verses 8 to 10. The psalmist writes, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let's stand and sing together. You're the word of God the Father. Join together in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Father, as we reflect upon the words which we have just sung, we bring you our praise. Praise for your Son, the Lord Jesus, the one who is the author of creation, the Lord of every man, the Word of God the Father. We praise you and approach you in his name, in the name of your Son, praising you for how you are, the, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, the God who is ever watchful and never sleeping. We praise you for your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding, for how all your ways are good and just, for how it is by your wisdom that this world was made, that it's by your wisdom and grace that salvation was accomplished. We praise you for, you, for how you are the God who, whose anger lasts a moment, but whose favor lasts a lifetime. The God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the beast of every field. The God who knows the number of stars in the sky, the number of grains of sand and the number of hairs on our heads. 
for how you know us better than we know ourselves. Father, we praise you for your ways are so much higher than our ways and your thoughts so much higher than our thoughts. Yet, Lord, for all your infinite wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, you aren't the God who stands afar off uncaring. You aren't the God who stands afar off with little concern for us. But you're a God with a tender heart towards us, a loving heart for us. You're the God who gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And for those who wait upon you, you, you renew our strength like the eagle. Father, we pray that we would know that renewing grace, that renewing strength today. That as we turn to you in Jesus' name, that you would turn our hearts to you. Forgive us for those ways in which we've turned our hearts away from you. Those ways in which we've stumbled in our faith or failed to love you with our whole hearts. Ways in which we've trusted our ways and not yours. Father, we thank you that in Jesus' name there is forgiveness. That in Jesus' name there's forgiveness because Christ came and, and died on the cross for all our sins. All those ways in which we would turn away from you. He came and died on the cross to turn us back to you. To bring us to you. And we come to you in Jesus' name asking that you would refresh us by your grace. That you would revive us by your spirit. That you would transform us into the likeness of your son, our saviour. In whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so this morning we continue our series in the book of Genesis, looking at the story of Abram. And so we turn there now to Genesis chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 1 to 16, the whole chapter. So Genesis 16, and you can find it on page 16 in the Pew Bibles. So Genesis 16. The story of Hagar and Ishmael. Let us hear the word of God. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah ill-treated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And, she, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You're the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son 
And Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Amen. We thank the Lord for this reading of his word. We're going to stand and sing together our hymn, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. He burns with holy fire, with splendor he is crowned. is shining all around. Be still for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. He comes to cleanse and heal to minister his grace. Join together in prayer. Let's pray. Loving and gracious Father, we pray that indeed you would come and minister your grace to our hearts now. That you would help us in in faith to receive from you, to hear your voice. We pray that as we hear your word now that it would help us that by your spirit it would not go in one ear and out the other, but rather you would help, it, help us to hear it with our ears, to receive it into our hearts and then show it in our lives, that we would go from this place rejoicing in you and walking by faith in you, the one who is the Lord of all. For we pray in the Saviour Jesus' name. Amen. We can all suffer from impatience, can't we? And it's something we can very easily find ourselves justifying. I was worn out. I was distracted. I was under, under a lot of stress. We can all find ourselves reaching for excuses when we're needlessly impatient. I usually put it down to tiredness that I didn't get enough sleep. That really I'm a patient person and if only I'd had enough sleep, then I wouldn't have been impatient with whoever it was, in the way that I was. Do you ever find yourself thinking this way? When in actual fact, the truth is that there's an impatience inside all of us that shows itself due to to various triggers or, or conditions. An impatience that at its root actually has an unwillingness to trust God and to submit to his timing for our lives. That's what we see in our passage today. An unwillingness to trust God an unwillingness to submit to God, an unwillingness to trust God's timing. 
and to believe that God does hear and does see. And in our, patient, in our passage, we see how this impatience on Sarai and Abram's part turns into a right old mist. Over the past few weeks, we've seen some very clear demonstrations of Abram's faith. We've seen him and Sarai step out in faith when they left Ur of the Chaldeans to follow God's call. Then we saw him submit to God's providence as he allowed Lot to choose where Lot was going to live. We also saw faith as, as, as Abram then uh, went into battle to rescue Lot. And then last week we saw in the midst of God's promise and God's covenant, how we read that Abram trusted God. He believed God, that he lived by faith. That's Abram, this man of faith. The father of faith for all who believe. And along with Sarai, his wife, Abram is a real hero of faith. Now, of course, in the Bible, there's only one superhero of faith. That's the Lord Jesus himself. But there are heroes of faith. Someone remembered and acknowledged in Scripture for their faith, and Abram's one of them. Only the thing is, the Bible's very careful, you might even say painfully honest, to describe those people in all the truth. That we hear of their failures, not just their triumphs. Those times when they falter in their faith, when they stumble in their faith, when they make a right mess of things. Today's passage tells of one of those messes, one of those stumbles. And yet in the midst of it all, we see a God of grace who hears and sees. So that's what we see today. And a bit like last week, I want to look at the passage under two headings, really, two sections. Verses 1 to 6, we see the impatience of God's people. And then verses 7 to 16, we see how God finds, hears, and sees. So first of all, the impatience of God's people, and then the God who finds, hears, and sees. In a sense, it's a, a picture of, of the scripture as a whole. We see God's people in their sin, in their mess, and God in his rescuing grace, and his mercy, and revealing himself. That's what we see today. So first of all, we see the impatience of God's people. It's been 11 years. 11 years since God made the promise to Abram. Since he first called Abram and gave him the promise that he would make him into a great nation. So that was 11 years ago they were called from Ur. And then 10 years since they've been in Canaan. 10 years of that promise in their heads that God had said he would make them into a great nation. So in that time, the promise has been enlarged upon, renewed. We saw it last week, for example, where Abram was told that he would have an heir, an heir who would come from his own body, and that his offspring would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. So those promises have been made, and prayers have been offered in response to those promises. Yet the situation, as far as Sarai at least can see it, is the same. Sarai, Abram's wife, has borne him no children, Abram's now in his mid-80s, Sarai's not far behind. And so she decides it's time to take things into her own hands. She's wondering, has God heard our prayers? Does God see our situation? Does he hear? Does he see? Well, either way, Sarai isn't hanging around any longer. But she's come up, come up with a plan and she brings it to Abram. This plan that he take a second wife, that he take Hagar the servant and build a family through her. Now, if you, remember, if you remember last week's story, we saw about the animals and them being cut in two and walking between the animals and so on, and it all sounded very foreign to us, very alien to us. Well, this week, there's aspects of the story seem quite foreign to us as well, very alien. This idea of the polygamy, of taking a servant as a second wife, it seems crazy, especially in light of last week's assurance from Abram to God, or from God to Abram, that a, a, a son would come from his own body. You know, Sarah maybe thought, well, it didn't speak about me, so it must have been somebody else. So she comes up with this plan. Now, this plan was in line with the custom of the day to a certain extent, at least, because there's historical documents from Assyria from that time gave a provision that if a wife 
did not produce children for her husband within two years, that she herself could buy a slave woman, and that after that slave woman had given birth to a child, that the husband could sell her off to whoever or wherever he wished. The surrogate system of Abram's day all sounds quite brutal, but that's what could have happened, and that's what happens here as well. And we can see almost the sadness with which the writer recounts the whole story. Verse 1, we read Sarai, Abram's wife. In verse 3, we read that Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. We know that Sarai is Abram's wife and that Abram is Sarai's husband. We don't need to be told those details But the writer includes them here as a means of underlining the sadness of it all. As a means of underlining the pathos of the whole situation. This is the plan that Sarai comes up with. She runs it past Abram and they run with it. But you know, all the way through, well, they make a number of mistakes. But there's one particular mistake that at this point I I want to highlight. And it's a mistake they made back in chapter 12. In chapter 12, that was when the famine came to Israel and they ran off to Egypt. And the mistake I said they made then was that they had what I call 2D thinking. They thought just at a horizontal, earthly thinking instead of the 3D looking up to God. Well, they do the same here as well. No mention of prayer, no mention of Abram sacrificing to God at any of the altars he'd built. No mention of looking to God and his will. Instead, they just work on, come up with this plan and run with it. They leave God out of their thinking. Run out, with, run out of patience. and come up, come up with this own crazy plan. The Hagar, of course, conceives, but from there it all goes horribly wrong. Hagar, we read, despises Sarai. Sarai blames Abram. Abram tries to wash his hands of the whole thing. And then it ends up with Sarai taking her out her grief and frustration on Hagar. Abram and Sarai should have been a blessing to Hagar, you see. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was what God had said in one of his promises to Abram. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So they, they should have been a blessing to Hagar. But on this occasion, far from being a blessing, they were the opposite of that. You know, God has blessed us as his people. That if we know Christ, we've been blessed in so many ways. So the question for us is, are we a blessing to others? We've been saved by grace to extend grace to others. Are we a blessing to others? Are we gracious to others? Do we reflect Christ to others and draw others to him? Or do we repel others in some way? Are we, as individuals or as a church, an open door to the gospel? Or are we an obstacle to others coming to the Lord? Abram and Sarai here should have been a blessing to Hagar. Their lives should have drawn and attracted her to the Lord. But instead, the way they're living just repels her. They shove her away, push her down, and so she runs. Their impatience was a sin that led to other sins. They don't look to God. They don't wait in him. They don't trust him. And so there's a whole sorry mess. But God steps into messes, doesn't he? God steps into messy situations. God in his grace turns messy situations around. And that's what we see him do here. As he meets Hagar where she is, he finds her, he hears her, he sees her. Verses 7 to the end. Hagar goes on the run and she heads for home. And we read here that uh, the angel finds her on the road to Shur. Now whether Abram or Sarai had noticed she'd gone, we aren't told, but God had noticed. And he finds her at this place on the road to Shur, which is in the direction of Egypt, back home. She was heading for her home. But we read here that this angel of the Lord finds her. And four times we read of this angel of the Lord. And as verse 13 implies, it's the Lord himself 
in some physical form who meets with, with Hagar. The angel finds Hagar and calls her by name. He asks her where she's come from and where she's going. And when she tells him she's running away from her mistress Sarai, he immediately tells her to go back and submit to her. Now why, we might ask, was she sent back? Why did the angel send her back to that house if she'd been mistreated? Why did he send her back to that place where she didn't feel at home? Well, it's because the angel knew, God knew, that the only place of blessing for her was under Abram and in his home. It wasn't in Egypt, but it was with God's people. So he tells her to go back, and then he tells her these wonderful words of blessing in verses 11 and 12. Words of prophecy that speak of a son, that speak of a son who will be called Ishmael. And then we're told the reason for the name. If you look in the footnotes, we're told Ishmael means God hears. God hears. Hagar is told, the Lord has heard of your misery. The Lord knows what you've gone through. He knows the affliction you've faced, the harsh treatment you've faced. God hears. He says, I know what's on your heart. And to further calm her fears, he tells her the kind of man that Ishmael will be and what lies ahead of him. Now, I don't imagine we would like to be called a wild donkey, but nonetheless, they were overall words of encouragement to Hagar, words that assure her that he wasn't going to be, that Ishmael wasn't going to be a servant like her, but he was going to be independent, albeit someone who would live a life of hostility towards others. But for Hagar, she's just thankful. Thankful that God has found her, that he's heard her cries, and that he's seen what she's going through. Look at verses 13 and 14 there, which are key verses, I think, for this passage. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you're the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that name of the well, Beer Lahai Roy, that means well of the living one who sees me. Hagar said, I've seen the one who sees me. God in his grace has revealed himself to Hagar. God in his grace has reached out to this servant, an Egyptian background, a pagan, yet someone who was loved by God, someone reached out to by God, and someone who God, whom God chooses to reveal himself to. Someone who found out that God heard her and saw her. You see, Sarai and Abram weren't so sure anymore. They had grown impatient with God. They'd got to the point if God wondered, if they wondered if God was hearing their prayers. If, 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 if God saw the sadness in their hearts. But we're reminded here that God does see. God does hear. God knows. And in his time and in his way, he chooses to act. Maybe you're in the position of wondering if God's hearing your prayers. Maybe in the position of wondering whether God sees what you're going through. Maybe wondering, does God see the sadness in my heart? Maybe you have a, a child you've been praying for, a grown child who's brought up in the faith, taught the faith, loved in the faith, and yet shows no evidence of faith or no sign of the Holy Spirit at work in them. And you're wondering, does God hear my prayers for that child? Or maybe you're, you've been suffering from some physical condition, maybe a a constant condition or something that recurs from time to time and you've been praying about it and praying about it. You've tried all the medications, but nothing seems to work. And you're wondering, does God see? Or maybe you've been suffering at the hands of someone else, maybe at work or school or wherever. Maybe at home and you wonder, God, do you see what I'm going through? Have you heard my prayers? And I think what we see here in the sympathy with which the Bible tells this story is an assurance that God does see, that God does hear, that God does care. If we were to move a book further on in our Bibles, we'd come to the story of the Exodus. And we see at the start the children of Israel enslaved in Egypt. And we read there how they groaned in their slavery and cried out to God. 
and that their cry in their slavery went up to God and that God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob and that he looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. But his concern didn't end there. But before long, and in his time, he chose to act and he acted by freeing the Israelites from their slavery. God hears. God sees. But what then of Hagar, Sarai, and Abram? Well, Hagar obeys God's word and goes back to Sarai and Abram. Ishmael is born, and Abram takes him as his own. Ishmael, God hears. What of Sarai? Well, she will need to wait a bit longer. Another five chapters till Isaac is born. And maybe in the midst of all this, though, she'll have learned something of how God does hear, God does see. And Abram, what does God do in light of this awful mess he's got himself into? Well, God's gracious. Just as he was when he brought him back from Egypt, God is gracious here. Gracious in the fact that we know him as a man of faith rather than a man of failure. Gracious in that God remains faithful to the promises he's made to him. In spite of Abram's foolishness here, his ignoring of God, his acting totally without reference to God, God continues to be gracious to him, just as God always is, that he's faithful to himself, even when we are unfaithful to him. Hagar, Sarai, and Abram. But what about you? You see, the writer doesn't just tell us a story to teach us about these three. But he teaches us the story to teach us about ourselves. But first and foremost, to teach us about God and to call us to faith in him. Faith in a God whose grace doesn't dry up because we mess up. Faith in a God whose grace doesn't run out because of our stupidity. But a God whose grace is abundant in Christ. A God who sent a son to seek and save the lost. A God who sent a son to die on the cross to rescue us from all our mess ups, all our sin. A God who hears you and sees you and loves you in Christ. So let's come to him in prayer. Father, we thank you again for your word to us today. We thank you for how it shows us so clearly uh, your mercy to your people. How, for how it reveals uh, so much of your character to us. How you are a God who sees and hears. That you hear our prayers. That you see our lives day by day. That you watch over us. And you don't just see us and hear us, but you care for us. And in your time and in your way, you act according to your perfect plan and will. Lord, forgive us for those times when we make decisions without any reference to you, when we make decisions based upon our thinking rather than yours, when we step out without faith, when we live without looking to you. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to know you as the God you are. To know that in whatever we go through, that you hear us and see us. Help us to live by faith. We thank you that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, so that we could live by faith. So that we could come to you in faith. So that we could know you as our God. That rather than just reading about you, on a page, but that we would know you in our experience, that we would know you in our lives. Help us, Lord, to know you and trust you and follow you with all that each day brings. We pray in the Saviour Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before the children join us from Sunday school, we will have the announcements. And I suppose just um, to mention a few things today is our tear fund 
service and we will be remembering the work of Tear Fund in our prayers in a moment or two and then we'll have our, our lunch through in the hall and uh, the donations from the lunch will go towards the uh, Tear Fund Turkey and Syria appeal. As I mentioned last week, the moderator had sent out a letter uh, saying that he wasn't going to set up a moderator's, moderator's appeal as such, but encouraged us to give towards the earthquake appeal in various ways, one, is, one of which is through supporting Tear Fund, which we will do. So please do join us for lunch. Please do stay if you can. Um, and in their absence, we pass on our thanks to those uh, ladies who are through preparing that now. And we'll be uh, serving it, uh, and all who will be serving it and playing their part in a wee while. Then next week, next Sunday, we have a morning service or midday service and an evening service. So Owen will be preaching at our 12 o'clock service, and then I'll be preaching at our evening service, which is in the hall at 7, and we'll be looking at Genesis 17. Uh, so that's our two services next Sunday. Then there's no midweek this week, um, but you're very much encouraged to go along to Cookstown Bible Week if you can. Uh, the, the times of it were on the announcement sheet, so it's um, 8 o'clock most nights, put it like that. I think 8.15 tonight maybe, and 7.45 on Wednesday, uh, and you're encouraged to go along to that. Then there's a committee meeting on Thursday, 8.30 in the meeting room. And then for those who've put their, down, put their names down for 10-pin bowling on Saturday, uh, I'll send out a message for that at the, in the early part of the week with further details about that. But I think there are all the announcements for this week, and we join now in our prayers for others. So let's pray. Loving, gracious, and almighty God, we come to you now in prayer. And as we come, we thank you that you are the Lord of all the earth, that you are the God who holds this world in the palm of your hand. That you are the God who um, is the Lord of each and every uh, nation. And Lord, we pray in particular at this time for the nations of Turkey and Syria as they've been caught up in the earthquake. And we pray for all those engaged in the emergency response at this time following the earthquake. We pray for all those, uh, we pray that supplies would go to those in greatest need. And for the injured, the traumatized and grieving to know your comfort and your healing. We pray, Lord, for your church in Turkey and Syria. We pray for your people, that you would help them to continue to be a shining light in those lands, that in the midst of the hugely challenging circumstances, that you would help them just to practically uh, reach out with your love uh, and grace to those around them. We pray also for the country of Ukraine as they come to the Hugely uh, sad occasion of the one year anniversary of the war starting there. And we pray that that war would come to an end soon. We pray, Lord, for peace to come. We pray for an end to hostility. And we pray for a resolution, a peaceful resolution to be found. We pray also for uh, our own nation, especially in light of the talks that uh, the local political leaders held with Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, on Friday. We pray for wisdom, for direction. We help. We pray that you grant uh, direction and leading to our leaders, that you would help them to find a way forward for the political situation here in Northern Ireland, that you would lead them, that they would serve with wisdom, with honesty, with compassion. Would we pray for our own community here in Eglis, we pray for your blessing upon it. We pray, Lord, you'd help us to uh, be those who live out our faith day by day and, and, and act justly, show mercy and walk humbly. And we pray also for those within our congregation uh, and uh, within our wider families who are in particular need of prayer at this time. We pray for those who are unwell, for those who are uh, going through treatment, for those who are, are grieving, for those who are finding life difficult. And in the silence, we take a moment to bring to you those who are on our hearts.
Loving and merciful Father, we pray for your blessing upon us. We thank you for hearing our prayers. And we pray for your hand upon us as a congregation, that we would see your encouragement, that we would see uh, ever-growing signs of your spirit at work amongst us. That would bring much glory to the name of Jesus in this place. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Morning, everybody. Come on in. We're going to stand and sing together our hymn. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Right, I want you to think back to when you first went to school, your first day in P1 or nursery, whatever it was, were you just kind of, did your parents, parents just come and open the door and say, on you go, walk on from here, or what happens? Can you remember? <laughs> Do you think they would have said, okay, there's the school, you find your way to your class, or would they have walked with you to the classroom? They would have walked with you to the classroom, wouldn't they? Or when you were learning to ride a bike, what happened? Lexi. Pardon? They held the bike, exactly. They held the bike until you got the hang of it. And then usually maybe at some point when you were cycling away, they let go without you knowing. And then it was only afterwards you realized, wow, I've been cycling. Or when you were learning to swim, did they get you to the side and kind of push you in and say, on you go, Move your arms and legs. <laughs> Did anybody get pushed in like that? Or, or what happened to other people? <laughs> Darcy. They gave you a float or maybe, maybe held you and said, okay. Maybe, depends what size you were. Maybe held you and said, okay, you move your arms and legs. And then when you're moving your arms and legs well enough, probably went to lessons, but if not, uh, you may be held and then eventually when you're moving your legs and arms well enough that they let go and you thought, oh wow, I can hold myself up here with my arms and legs. So somebody was with you who helped you. Somebody was with you who knew the way, who knew what to do and was able to help you. Now, in the past few weeks we've been looking at the story of Abram in church. And Abram was somebody, if you remember, was called by God to go from a place that he didn't know to another place. God helped him. But to help us think about this, I brought a blindfold with me. And I'm going to need somebody to help me. Now, what we can do, either I can blindfold you and help you, or you can blindfold me. What would you like to do? Mike, his hand, your hand up first. Blindfold you, you okay? On you come. 
what we're going to do Yeah. Alright, should it be blindfolded? Can't see, can you? No. Sure? Yeah. Okay, we'll put it this way. I wore the blindfold in Castle Coffee and I couldn't see, so we'll... Okay, so we'll turn you around. What we're going to do, we're going to get a book or something on the back of the church. You're going to need to trust me, okay? Alright, so first thing we need to do We'll turn you around this way. Okay, so watch the step. Oh, don't fall down. Okay, and let's see. So we'll go in here. So, step my arms, you can go in. Put out your right hands. Down, 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 down. down. Back. There, can you the Bible? the Bible up high. Good. Okay, so we'll give Micah a round of applause. Well done. Now, what was it that Micah had to do? Ollie. You had to give him directions to go. And he had to trust me, didn't he? Yeah. He had to trust that I would give him right directions, that I would help him, that I, that I knew where he was supposed to go. So he had the trust that I would take him in the right direction. And that's what we see in Abram's story. He had the trust when God called him to go from Ur of the Chaldeans to the place he didn't know. And at that point, God didn't actually tell him where he was going. He had the trust that God was good, that God knew where he was going, and that God would help him wherever he went. And Abram and Sarai trusted God and followed him. Now, sometimes... They didn't trust God. And there's kind of ups and downs in the story. Sometimes when they trust God well, when they live by faith. And there's other times when they kind of make a mess. And with the grown-ups today, we saw a bit of a mess in the story. But usually they trust God and believe that because God knows um, the right way, that God knows where they're going, that God knows the best way to live, they trust God and follow him. And you know, just as God was with Abram and Sarai, he's with us as well. And we face all kind of new things in life. You know, each day or each week, we'll have to do new things or maybe go to new places or maybe have new things in life. And we haven't done it before, but we know that God is with us. And just as God was with them, God's with us and he will help us and just wants us to trust him and ask him for his help. So let's pray together and pray that God will bless us. Dear God, thank you that you're a God we can trust, that you're a God who is good, that you're the God who knows all things, and that in your word you teach us how you call us to live. Lord, help us to trust you with all that the week ahead holds. We don't know what will happen. We don't know what each day will bring. But Lord, you know, and we thank you that you will be with us with all that each day brings. And help us just to trust you and to know that because you're good, that you will lead us and bless us and guide us. So help us with all that life brings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to stand to sing our closing hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Lord, 
from his hands, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love, oh, mingled down, did have such love and sorrow meet, our thorns compose, so rich a Thanks to Eula and Michelle for the, for the music, for, for Trevor and Jeff on the desk and the guys in the door as well. And our thanks also to all those who will play their part in uh, our lunch today. But as we finish, we, we read these words from 1 Corinthians before we turn to the grace. Be watchful, stand firm in your faith, be courageous and strong. Let all that you do be done in love. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>